Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We are on episode 40 of this awesome podcast, and I have a wonderful guest here. I have Al Boyce, who is a homebrew aficionado in Min- Min- Minnesota, Minneapolis area, right? Yep. So uh, Al is here to chat with us about um, his mead baking experience, but he also has some experience in other fields. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Al, I am super glad you're here. Nice to meet you, Gert. So I will tell you, go and spoil, I, I did creep a little bit because I wanted, part of this is to get to know you. I started kind of Googling your name and I found out some fun things. Um, and you could totally tell me if I'm right or wrong <laughs> or if I got a different Al voice. But uh, from what I see, you are the director of the beer judging program with the BJCP. Is that true? No, I, well, I'm a director. I'm a, a director, I'm finance, finance director. Oh, awesome. Awesome. How long have you been doing that? Ooh, since about uh, 2004, I was a regional rep at the time, and I was the treasurer. And when I was uh, ousted as a regional rep, they offered me, they created a new position called finance director because they didn't want to lose my, uh, <laughs> yeah. my method. So now yeah. there's a treasurer, and I'm, a, I'm the finance director, and I report to the treasurer. That is, that's fun. Is that a, um, a, I don't know, cumbersome job? Are you, is it a year round thing or is it a seasonal little thing for you? Oh, it, it's year round. I do a monthly reports to okay. the treasurer and then they uh, do a report to the president and the, the vice president of the organization and sort of as a um, fail safe. Uh, when I took over some older BJCP remembers the, the, the person who was, the treasurer slash president before me um, embezzled oh, all no. the ACP. So hmm. tr- well, trying to well. not let that happen anymore. <laughs> uh, I, I, that's funny. Well, I, so I, Googled, I Googled your name and found that, and I thought that was pretty fun. Um, and then I also found another fun thing. So I see back in 2017 that you were in the best of show results for the Mazer Cup. Could you tell us about that? Through that, yep. It's it's actually kind of embarrassing. Uh, I, I entered a uh, mead in the historical category of Polish mead, and I entered it solely based on the fact that to me, it tasted like a Polish mead. Uh-huh. And uh, I did another podcast after that, and they were asking me all about Polish meads. This is I don't know, tasted like a Polish mead, so I entered it that way. Uh, but uh, it, it, uh, it's a sludge mead, and, and I guess um, I, I kind of learned that technique from Kurt Stock. But uh, at, the, at the bottom of every uh, carboy, there's about that much stuff that you can't get out unless you want to siphon up the sludge, for lack of a better term. So <laughs> Kurt started just saving that, and every batch he made, he just dump a little more sludge and a little more sludge till pretty soon he had that much sludge, but he had, you know, that much liquid on the top that he can get at so uh you know it, sometimes it turns out sometimes it doesn't but uh this particular match that i won uh actually first place in uh historical and then like you say i was in the in the best of show runnings second second runner first runner up i think i heard um i don't recall but uh it was that mead and it was a sludge mead and it sat in my basement for eight years Oh wow! The air lock wow. ran out several times, and um, it, all that oxidation just reminded me of a Polish mead. Yeah, wow. that's really interesting. I was uh, there's a a really great series um, that Chop and Brew, who's another YouTube channel, has done. He talked to the the uh, mead maker of the year, and that mead maker of the year was doing a whole big podcast series with a bunch of the uh, awesome big mead makers, Kintram and all right. those people. And uh, the specific one oh, I was that's watching. Josh Holbrook. He's he's one of the one of my compadres. Up, he's not in Minneapolis, but he's one of the people oh. I have to compete with regularly. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was. It was really fun to get to hear him talk. And the guy he was talking to at the time was um, talking all about Polish meads, and it, it kind of inspired me to go down that road. Um, eventually, they they are uh, quite the task. You know, it's not a small feat to to do that. So that's super impressive though. I would love to um, get involved with more Mazer Cups. So my question now is how many Mazer Cups have you entered at this point? Uh, I think 
two or three. That's the only one I've ever won. But okay, that's awesome. Yep, so I would like long... to. I have not attended uh, to judge one yet, but that's on my bucket list too. That would be really fun. How long have you been homebrewing in general? Um, I, I think uh, I started probably back in the early 90s. I'm thinking 90, 92, 91, somewhere in there. Uh, we started with beer. And um, I remember some, and, and I brewed extract only for nine years before I got into mm-hmm. brewing all grain. And uh, mead making came a little later even than that. But um, the I remember the kits we would get would be a can of malt syrup. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. the instructions would be boil this up, add three pounds of sugar, dump in some yeast. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, and it was still better than most of the stuff we could buy. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> that's fun. So what do you, do you remember your first mead that you made at the time? I do. Um, it was an, or- it was a straight orange blossom mead. And um I was inspired to make mead by a, a trip to Ireland back in the 80s, 86, no, 80, 82. I went to Bunratty Castle, and they had a medieval dinner with wenches walking up and down. And I don't mean to be politically incorrect, but they call themselves wenches. So uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, walking up and down the table with uh, pewter pitchers of Bunratty mead and just filling it up endlessly in, in your cup. And I remember liking it quite a lot. And uh, did not really think about it till I got back back home a few years later. I don't know where I read about it. Somebody was making mead. And uh, a guy in our, our club, actually, Gary Sinan, was making something. He, he made two types of braggot. One was four by four and one was six by six. And the four by four was four pounds of extract and four pounds of honey. Mm-hmm. And the six by six, obviously, then six pounds of extract, six pounds of honey both in five gallons. So the second one was pretty <clears throat> impressive. But anyway, yeah. I said, wow, give this a try. Got hold of some orange blossom honey and I was hooked. I, I still, orange blossom, still my go-to honey. Yeah. yeah. So was, was that first <laughs> mead, uh, was it successful in your opinion or was it? Because oh, like, yeah. I look back at my first ones, like I've got a couple of them back here and maybe it's the age on them or something, but i and now going, holy crap, I've learned a lot since that, that time. Yeah. I, I think it was successful in spite of myself. It was delicious. Um, I remember I was off to a beer club meeting or something, and I downed a whole bottle of it before I, before I drove off to my beer club meeting, and my girlfriend was saying, maybe you shouldn't be driving right now. So it's really good. Yeah. Uh, another another mead. That I made when that girlfriend and I got married. Uh, we, I, I, when I came home from the honeymoon, I made a batch of mead, and uh, I rushed it. I did not fine it. I did not do any any stabilization or anything after that. But uh, to this day, we share one bottle per year on our honeymoon or on our anniversary and and uh it's gotten amazingly complex oh that's so interesting okay so i have a a mead that is the exact same situation i wanted to make an anniversary mead and so and and i have gone ahead and finished it started this huge pear and apple mead and you know i it's high gravity pretty sweet so that i'm hoping it'll age well um i guess my question to you is on that long term mead have you noticed um uh, is have you noticed a peak like has it gotten is there a point where it was its best and now it's starting to come down or is it continually rising getting better uh, it it changes uh, the oxidation certainly has taken over mm-hmm. but in sherry like tones mm-hmm. and so it's it's to me it's not distracting it's it's way more fruity now than it was when it started it's straight clover honey so there is no fruit in it it's just fruitiness from the yeast and the, and the age and the alcohol. Is it dry? I know it's quite sweet. <laughs> and it's also naturally sparkled. And I do mean sparkled. It's not peddling. It pours oh. out like champagne. And I have yet to have a bottle blow, which is also <laughs> success in spite of myself. I would not recommend that to anybody. 
And it can be sketchy. That could be real sketchy. How many, so how many years, uh, how old is this meet at this point? Well, we're going to celebrate our 23rd anniversary this year. So that's awesome. That My goal is a, I have this 25 year one. And so I'm hoping to make, get 25 years out of it, but, um, I guess we'll see. <laughs> so quite, I told quite wife, some time. Uh, I made, I made 48 bottles of it. And I said, uh, so we'll have one a year. And if I still like you 48 years from now, I'll make another batch. <laughs> if not, funny. I get an option. <laughs> that is awesome. That's so fun. I, I can't believe, um, I can't believe you're doing that. That is, that's really cool. Especially cause I'm making something like that. And I, I'm excited to see the long term. It's, it's a really fun thing. And I've recommended it to guys and, and gals who have their, have their first kid or second or third kid make a batch to me for them. Put mm-hmm. it down and, and serve it on their 21st birthday and give it, give them the, well, give them a case at least. Maybe you don't want to give it all to them, but you know, yeah, it'd be, a, it would be, think of what a special gift that would be. Mm-hmm. That's so fun. So in your home brewing now, obviously you still do some home brewing. Um, I, at least I assume, are you making mostly beer or wine or mead? Is it a little bit of everything at this point? Mostly mead. This is uh, an elderberry that I just bottled for, uh, yesterday. Okay. And it's petalant and lovely. So um, I used to do uh, folk music house concerts before COVID. Mm-hmm. We would um, bring uh, itinerant folk musicians into our home, usually people who are traveling between Chicago and Seattle and had no gigs in the middle. And I'd offer them, you know, a free bedroom and a free meal and, you know, 20 bucks a head for, for a show. And, and we really had some great people over the years, but I would always make a, uh, batch of beer for that and you know free to our to our audience members and our and our um, performers as well of course uh-huh. uh, meat is a little scary to serve at those things because as you know people who aren't used to it and they drink a pint it's gonna it's gonna take a toll on the old brain cells yeah i had a um i have a friend who he's like six six big dude and um he's used to drinking beer and so i gave him a bottle of it was like sparkling watermelon mead and you know he assumed it's normal beer bottle he's like ah oh, this will be like five percent and he starts going at it and i mean he, big dude he's 300 some odd pounds and he had one bottle and he was like holy cow i'm feeling it <laughs> i was like yeah did you look at the bottle it said like 16 percent. he was like what on earth? So some people I don't put know. It on tap, I usually put up a sign with big triple X's and saying danger will Robinson. <laughs> so, um, are you, you said you have an orange blossom mead as your, I'm not, I'll say flagship, something you make a lot. Is there, or are there other recipes that you are repeating quite a bit at this point? Are you very experimental in this whole stage? Um, I, I'm, don't make orange blossom a lot, but I do use orange blossom as my base mm-hmm. a lot. And uh, I guess one mead that I'm I'm still experimenting with and still finding new as new new facets of it, I should say, is uh, a uh, I'll say I invented this mead because um, I first had it as a beverage in Jamaica called sorrel, mm-hmm. which is um, a, a drink they make at Christmas time with uh, hibiscus flowers and ginger oh. and it's not it's not no honey it's not fermented but they will mix it half and half with rum okay, and okay. give it and, and they put sugar in it too obviously and then they keep it refrigerated but uh, then they they can give it to the kitties as, as straight you know it's like straight pop almost mm-hmm. not carbonated but as juice or adults can have it with rum and i i had that and i went oh this is just begging to be a mead so I've been experimenting with that. Um, the most recent iteration, I made a couple batches of this now, uh, was based on a BJCP judging trip I did down to a commercial competition in Mexico. And uh, I was asked to judge meads down there because nobody else knew how. Uh, I was surprised that they even had a mead, mead division. But uh, the first place mead was a rosemary mead and when I saw that on the pull sheet, I went, oh, this is, rosemary is just hard to brew with because you go a little bit over and it tastes a lot over. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That one first place, actually, was delicious. 
And then somebody else made a mead called Jamaica mead, which later I learned in Spanish, Jamaica means um, hibiscus. Oh. And that was second place mead. And it turned out to be the same guy, the same, it was a, a commercial brewer. And uh, when, when we got done with it, we did the chocolate peanut butter trick, you know, started blending those and I went, oh, this is, so as soon as I got home, that was the next mead I made was a sorrel rosemary. So are you in your, in this mead, are you fortifying then? Or are you just blending, like you have your bottle and you're blending with rum? Like um, it's no, I don't. I don't use rum at all. Oh, okay. Um, I'll I'll back that up in just a second. But it's I just make a straight mead out of it now. I just rather than adding rum, I just ferment it with okay. honey and make a, a, a sorrel ginger or a sorrel rosemary mead. Now okay. the rosemary I found here's where I'm backing it up. I will take either rum or vodka and make an infusion of the rosemary, mm. and then just sprinkle it into the batch until I get the amount that I want of rosemary. And uh, my, my biggest failing so far is not enough rosemary. Surprised the hell out of me. But when I've entered the contest, and people are saying, could you use more rosemary? So, wow. So. so is that the toughest spice to use in mead making in your experience? Or is there something you've had that's even more difficult? I don't think it's tough. I don't think it's tough to use. I trying to think back to a spice that I found was difficult. Um, wasabi, I guess, was difficult. Um, because straight wasabi mead? Just straight? I, I, yes. I made a wasabi mead. And the reason it's difficult is because, I didn't know this, but the part of wasabi that's hot is not wasabi. That's just the flavor. It's, it's usually a hot mustard that, that is blended in with the sabi. And so the green paste you get in with your sushi tray is, is that. It's, it's wasabi mixed with, with some sort of hot spice. So uh, I, I dosed my mead with, with wasabi and was really surprised to find that it had no heat. And I, I was going for the flavor, but I wanted the heat also. So I had to find some, some peppers to, uh, to add to it to bring it up to the hot level I wanted. Okay. And that was a love it or hate it mead. People just think of wasabi and mead and they go, you know, Mr. Yuck. But the people who loved it really loved it. It sounds interesting. That's for sure. I, I love those crazy combinations. You know, I'm part of my, my YouTube world is like, what silly set of ingredients can I just throw together and see what happens? And so that, that seems like a lot of fun. Um, interesting. I, I feel like I've heard of people trying wasabi meads, but I, I'll get there one day. I'll be ambitious enough. I had a uh, reaction. For, there was a, a period of years where, I don't know, it's still going on, but Chipotle was everything. I mean, Chipotle was, let's add Chipotle to beer, to me, to everything. And it was, some of them were good. Some of them were pure hot and some of them were pure smoke. And, you know, I, and I, I think my reaction though was there's other hot things in the world. Uh -huh. You know, there's, there's a million flavors, a lot of hot things rather than just a Chipotle. Uh, so my first try at that was with hot cinnamon. Mm. Uh, there's a spice company in St. Paul called Penzi's, and they, have, they bring in spices from all over the world. A lot of cities, I'm sure all cities have something like that. But I went down there and just spent the day sampling every kind of cinnamon that they had. And so eventually I made a mead with uh, four types of hot cinnamon. Hmm. And uh, I don't know, when I was a kid, I think I, I think I just saw them on the shelf, so I think they're still available. There was these hot toothpicks you can buy, cinnamon toothpicks. Interesting. And, or red hot candies. That's, yeah. that's what yeah. probably most people know. And so that's kind of what I was going for. And uh, when I got done with it, it needed something a little extra, so I added some cherry also. So I, I call that my cherry bomb. Uh -huh. Cherry bomb uh -huh. made. Uh, that sounds good, huh? I've done so. I did a um, a fireball hard seltzer where I literally bought those atomic fireballs, a big, big old batch of them, and I made a hard seltzer out of it. And it was surprisingly good. You know, I, I kegged it and um, I did a version that was like bottle carbonated, and I was expecting it to be really pretty, pretty gross. And it wasn't bad. It, obviously, not everyone's cup of tea. Hot, that kind of spice is, uh, like you said, some people are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it. But uh, it's a lot of fun to 
experiment around with. Um, okay, so I want to know how, in all of your media making experience, have you found that um, there are just some things that should not be a mead that you have tested and you've gone, nah, that, that should not be a thing. Um, I'm, I, I'd probably, yeah. In judging meads, I'm sure that I've said that probably dozens of times. Yeah. In fact, people who I've judged with said just because you can, doesn't mean you should, you know? Yeah. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Okay. Um, your your listeners can well if they, I have can a whole... find a pod, if they can find a podcast I did at the National Homebrew Conference conference about Coon Pecker Scrumpy. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> the story's been told, so Yeah. That's fun. Um do you have a a honey varietal that you have like always wanted to use but haven't had a chance to at this point? Because I'm sure you've done a lot with different honeys um i i've done tasmanian leather wood which was the most expensive varietal i've used to date uh -huh. um and and uh it, i've i've heard some people love that or hate it i guess i i come in to love that side but i would i would like to try a uh, traditional heather uh-huh uh, me too I, 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 where do you get that where did you get that um Tasmanian leather honey, leather Tas honey. Tasmania. Tasmania, sorry. Uh, it, I got it off of Amazon, really. Okay. Huh. There's a I've, company that imports it. Oh, uh, okay. I've used, I used, uh, the most expensive for me has been Manuka, and it was uh, for a video, and it's just, Manuka honey is just outlandish, you know. You can go and. And was it worth it? Mm, no, the funny part of my video was I, I made this mead, and I, you know, I got 1.1 pounds of it for 60 bucks. And so, and I only got what turned out to be uh, three, 375 milliliter bottles out of it. And uh, it cleared, surprisingly. I didn't think it would clear, but it did. And I, so I, part of my tasting, I tasted it, kind of gave my notes. And then I called my wife in and said, hey, I want you to taste this. And so I had her put on, put on her microphone. And she goes, this is pretty good. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> this is real expensive. <laughs> so... It's better, uh, better better love that one glass because that's all you're gonna get <laughs> exactly it was like I 20 bucks a, a bottle it wasn't particularly expensive but i did make a meat out of uh hawaiian christmas berry honey mm. and uh it it was really pretty disappointing uh, in mm. terms of aroma and flavor it was um it was nothing to speak of and i i uh went online and, and said what is this supposed to smell and taste like and i it says anise and coconut. Huh. And so I went out and bought some extracts and dosed it mm -hmm. and went way overboard. And uh, so I, I still serve it, but I don't tell people it's Christmas berry. I just say it's anise coconut. And oddly, mm -hmm. it's one people's choice a lot. Mm -hmm. um, people, and I take it to parties and stuff, and people say, this is your best one. I went, wow, who knew? <laughs> Well, I mean, that, that shows, though, that you know, obviously you have a pretty defined palette to be able to, to pull those things in. And that's, that's tough. That's something I've struggled with for a long time now. And I'm still, you know, long time into this. Long time. I'm a couple years into this. And I am, uh, I feel like so novice in some ways. And a lot of it comes down to just the fact that mead making is, it's not a cookie cutter. You, you know, I could give somebody, I could give you a mead recipe and the ingredients you buy, even if I tell you to buy dark cherries from Walmart and whatever could turn out completely different. And so it's, it's a little tough. Yeah. Same with beer or wine. It's, it's, it's the tech, it's your technique. It's your patience. It's a lot of things. I am, I am being brought to school all over again by some of the new mead makers in, in my area, uh, people like Adam Bystrom, and Nathan Stegman are just kicking my ass in the competitions and their meads are delicious. Yeah. And so I'm, I, I really think probably your best bet and my best bet is to uh, get with them, mm -hmm. either bring them over to your house and, and have them brew with you and say, I, I wouldn't do that, you know, or 
you go over to their house and and brew with them uh, yeah. and learn, you know, and, and uh, swallow your pride and say, yeah, I've been making mead for 20 years, but it don't mean shit. You know, if if somebody's making better mead than you, then you should you should probably take note. Yeah, I I totally agree. And there even, um, I mean, there's there are so many like new YouTube mead makers that I'm learning from in that where I mean, I was talking to Nathan actually, um, like 20 minutes before we got on this call, and because I I messaged him, uh, we got in, con- in contact a while back, and so we were kind of going back and about, forth about something. But I am I definitely think everybody should find some sort of um, mentor. I know, men, yeah, I guess a mentor is a, the, probably the best word for it. So that's, it's just so important. Okay. I've got a question and, and about in this, in this age of uh, zoom and everything else, your mentor could be across the country from you. I mean, hop online and, you know, ask, ask for a, 20 minutes of their time, it'll probably do you good. That's probably, that's probably the coolest part. The only good thing to come out of this whole pandemic is that Zoom has been brought to my attention. And so I get to I get to do this. I get to talk to people that I otherwise might not be able to as easily talk to in this facet. And so it's, it is probably the only good thing to come out of it, I would say. Obviously, there are other things people can say, but something I've enjoyed. I've got a question about um, fruit and how you introduce fruit in your meads. Obviously, you spent a lot of time doing this. Are you spending most of your time putting fruits in the primary? Are you kind of waiting till post-primary to add fruit? Where do you, what do you do normally? Um, I, I, my, one of my early mentors was Kurt Stock, and he was a big proponent of adding it with the primary. Mm-hmm. So that's what I do, Bill. And are you um, are you juicing most of the time? Like not necessarily fruit press, but let's say you've made a, a pear, you know, meat. Are you are you juicing or doing anything to get the extra juice out? Pear is pear is a separate case, so I'll deal with that separately. But most of the time, no. Most of the time, I just freeze the fruit to burst the cells, mm-hmm. and and then. Um, most recently, I've been getting giving the meat a head start a day or two with just honey to get the ferment going nice and strong mm-hmm. and then dump the fruit in. Most frequently, I'll use a muslin bag, sanitized muslin bag, to keep the pulp out of the juice because there's just some, some fruit you'll never clear again if you introduce that pulp. I recently made a peach mead and uh, worked with a uh, Another great mead maker locally here, Kevin Meinsma. I don't know if you talked to Kevin yet, but he'd, he'd be a good, good Zoom also. Uh, he, he and I got together. and We actually did um, press those peaches, and uh, we, we, we peeled them first. This was a new thing for me. Uh, peeled and froze the skins. Oh, Sanitized right. them first, of course. Interesting. You know, and, and then fermented on the juice, and then, and actually, I think on that particular meat, at Kevin's suggestion, I did add the juice in the, in the <laughs> second. Um, so what was the purpose of, of peeling the, like the skins? Was it to add tannin in a later stage? Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've made a few peach meads, and that's one of the meads that I've never been able to clear. Um, mm-hmm. So to me, anything that, any technique that took the pulp out Sounded like a good idea. So yeah. the purpose of uh, they were they they were aged. They uh, we did not freeze those. We just let them get good and mushy, mm. and and carve the rotten bits off, and uh, then press them. And Kevin's got a really nice bladder press. So we pressed them and got the juice out. That removed the pulp issue, and the skins. Yeah, the skins were just to add extra character and tannin at the end. Were they added in the primary with it, or was it was it later on? Uh, both were added in the secondary. Okay. The the, the uh, juice was added actively in the secondary after first racking, and the skins were added um, probably two three weeks later. And they weren't left on the skins a really long time, but I really like how it came out. I've always and I was able to get it with with. Uh, 
findings that was able to get it crystal clear. So uh, that's one thing, you know, I, I mentioned pears earlier and then I, I had that same thing where I was like, Oh, well, pears is a bad example because pears for me, I've had a hard time clearing it. Uh, when you are clearing a mead, are you, what's your main method at this point for trying to clear things? Obviously it can be dependent on stuff, but do you have um, a standard? Time is the best, of course. Uh, let it, I, I let usually after secondary, I let my meads sit a good month at least uh, just to clear on their own. And then uh, I, I find um, going in before that time, if you, if after the secondary, if you can uh, quick chill it, you know, down to near freezing, that's going to drop a lot of stuff out too. And then um, I'm drawing a blank now, but, Finally, I used the, uh, the two-step solution, uh, the Cheta San. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kisa Salt uh, 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 and Cheta San, yeah. I think, of the two. Yeah. And that, that's, that, that regimen has worked really well for me. I've had very few things that I haven't been able to clear using those techniques. Yeah. Well, it, and I, uh, I agree. Time is like the penultimate one that I think everybody – wants to to have <laughs> down but it does become kind of tough because one day some things take forever to clear i had a i vividly remember i don't even i don't think it's up here maybe it is up here i had a, a pear meat or something that sat for two and a half years did not clear up any and i was like okay well, i'm just gonna let it set and set and set and maybe something will happen but it's just it's, some can be stubborn and so that's uh it's a challenge to deal with ultimately you know, if it's delicious, drink it up. Yeah, I have. So I, I kind of teetered back and forth over the years because I, when I first started, I was like, um, I was not that I didn't clear things, but I was not trying very hard to. If it didn't clear up easily or naturally, I was like, ah, forget it. And the the thing that's pushed me to do more clearing has just been sharing with friends and especially people who have no idea what meat is my friends my my close friends at this point they've tried my stuff so if i bring them something that's a little hazy they know that okay well he's previously he's made some okay stuff um so i trust this but you know it's the it's the friend i haven't seen in three years that i hand a bottle to that i go oh this is the only thing they're gonna try i wonder so maybe I still, decant it. i mean the the the, the anniversary meat that i referred to earlier that's got a good solid inch and a half of sludge on the bottom of every bottle. Yeah. And so, and, and like I said, it is beautifully sparkled. It's champagne like sparkling and it's, but I find if I decant it off carefully, it's, it's beautiful. It's crystal clear. It's like champagne. It's really delicious. So uh, maybe some of those, you know, put them down in a bottle and maybe, maybe they do have a little sludge layer at the bottom. Just decant it before you yeah. serve it. Uh -huh. That's not a bad idea. I haven't thought about recommending that. Most people just ask, just ask, you know, should I chill this? Should I, you know, drink it room temp? But I need to probably give a little more um, direction on how to drink it. If nothing else, tell them the, the sludge is probably all vitamin B and it's all good for you. <laughs> just, yeah. when, you're, when you finish the glass, just, just go ahead and chug the rest and you get your that's vitamins right. for the day. Got your vitamins for the day. Man, that's... <laughs> um, okay, I want... So you've been in this mead world for a long time. And I would love to know, what are some things that you've, or are there any things that you've seen change drastically over time? Obviously, process has somewhat changed. What are some other things that you've seen develop? Ken Tram. Yeah. Ken Tram changed the game. I mean, uh, everybody who hasn't bought the complete mead maker yet, you should, you're, you're missing the boat. And, uh, and he's, I mean, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of literature about Tasna and, and used to be just called SNA, S-N-A, right? That was the Ken yeah. Tram technique. And that's pretty much what I still use. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it was common knowledge back when I got into mead that a mead was going to take a year to two years mm -hmm. in the carboy. Mm -hmm. And I met a lot of people in my homebrew club who would not get into mead because they only had two carboys, you know, and did not want to give up the real estate for two years waiting for your mead to clear. It was also well known that your mead 
after that after that time was going to come out like rocket fuel and it was going to it was going to be fusel as hell and after after those two years then you should bottle it and put it away for three more years and who wants to make that yeah you know? ken shram changed changed it he said you don't have to make rocket fuel and you know kurt stock went to a um homebrew homebrew con used to be called nhc back then but went to a, a mead panel and charlie papazian you know god bless him and all the things he's done for homebrew and for mead and everything else but he got he was asked you know how long did he think it would take you know for a mead to make a mead and he said oh yeah two three years and then bottling and blah 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 and, you know and charlie's books represent that but then kurt said serve my meat around and he said this one was made seven weeks ago so yeah, yeah. and i've got some of the guys in my thing with clike yeast and everything else they're making a meat in a week now and i'm talking about a you know a 12 percent mead not 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 a hydromel so yeah i mean with proper yeast nutrition aeration that's the big change yeah, and, uh, and the fact and, you can uh, clear uh, them um, so quickly, you know, if you use proper or some things you can clear and, and stabilize and back sweeten, you can have that thing ready. Um, it is impressive how quick things can turn around. I don't, that doesn't I mean, don't, I don't recall the last time I've made, uh, some people who judge my meads may argue with this, but <laughs> last time I made, that, made a mead that was fusel, I don't recall the last time it was because you just don't need to. Mm -hmm. It's, you have to really... You really got to mess with the yeast and put them in an uncomfortable temperature. And of course, I do think uh, I've had a few situations where fusels do arise. And most of that, I think, has been temperature oriented and or nutrient. Like with those Kvike strains you're talking about, uh, they are pretty nutrient heavy. So if you don't necessarily feed them enough, sometimes they can get a little bit angry and, and put some things out. But they, they flip around pretty fast. And uh, early recipes like also said, add your acid, add your tannins, add all that stuff at the beginning. And it's, you're just giving your yeast a hellacious um, terroir to work in when you do that. So, and, and why add acid at all? If you, if your meat is delicious, you know, why add tannins at all? If, if it doesn't need the, the pucker, you know? Yeah. So uh, wait till the end, you know? I definitely, uh, that's, I guess that's what I've, the biggest thing I've seen. And, um, uh, Hydromels, that's that's the new thing that mm -hmm. um, I don't generally I don't make hydromels, but uh, I I really think that's the future of commercial meads. If you're going to have a tap room, you better have hydromels because otherwise you're going to serve your guests one maybe two glasses and they better go. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they're they're such a good gap or a bridge for people who aren't in this world at all, you know, people who drink ciders and beer and ales and anything that is non necessary, not a, a mead, getting something that 7% in their hands is going to open that door. And you, you brought up seltzer and that's, that's the big thing in the commercial world, but wouldn't you rather drink a fruity, delicious hydromel sparkling, mm -hmm. sparkled hydromel at 7% than a seltzer? I would. There's a, I can't remember what, what meter it is. I've talked to, I talked to him a while back and I'm blanking now, but their, their new goal is to make a, you know, 5% essentially hard seltzer strength mead, hard hydromel and trying to bridge that gap even more. And, and when that happens, I mean, we are going to be, I, I sure hope that mead explodes even more and this community grows from that because it'll be interesting to see. I would, um, I would be sad to see it ripped from the hands of craft mead makers. I hope they beat them to the punch. People like Michael Fairbrother are certainly doing that. Uh, he is, I believe, one of the, I think he is the largest winemaker in his state, mm. let alone mead. I think he's the single biggest winemaker in his state now and, and uh, leading, sort of leading the way in that. But uh, there's other great ones out there. Shram, obviously, I mentioned earlier. I just went down to Arizona and went to the Superstition tap room, mm, and I'm that's a fun. big Superstition yeah. fan now. They are fabulous. Uh, up here locally, we've got um, John Hamilton at White Winter. 
in Iron River, Wisconsin. He's been making great meads for years. Susan Rood has, I think, been on the scene now for about eight or 10 years in North in Fargo. She's great. And we've got a brand new mead maker here in Mini, in uh, actually in White Bear Lake, a uh, suburb of St. Paul called the White Bear Meadery. So, you know, uh-huh. I would, I'm, I'm loving this explosion of craft mead makers that are really succeeding. I mean, they're, they're financially making it. And, uh, you know, I, um, I would rather see one of them go big, like Michael Fairbrother than Budweiser. Or oh Miller, yeah, absolutely. To see them get into the into this um, into this game. Yeah. So, what are some things you've seen change over time? Is there anything that you wish you had seen change, like that you've seen just kind of stay stagnant in this mead community, or is it developing like you want? I I, I don't know if I have an answer to that question. Um, it's a tough I'm, one. I'm, yeah, I I'm just seeing, like I said, uh, I'm a, I'm a mead judge also. I'm a grandmaster in the BJCP program and a mead judge as well. And it's getting the exploding bottles, getting the you know the the super funky sour fusel meads. You just don't see that anymore. I'm really pleased to see that. Um, uh, I want to put in a plug for. Uh, a mead competition I'm involved with here in the Twin Cities called Valkyrie's Horn. Yeah, um, we're we're on, we're just completed our third year, and we did years two and three in the middle of COVID, and we had 250 entries last year in the middle of COVID. So, um, people are making mead. People are sending them around the country. Heck, I just sent six meads off to Poland. So, wow, you know, I, I think the. Uh, Awareness is of, of mead and uh, of quality mead making is really on the rise. I don't know. Is so, that, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah no, it's great. That, that is, that's perfect. Um, so how do you, uh, this is an uh, interesting thing. How do you prepare s- uh, shipping something to Poland? I mean, that's a long way to go. Obviously, are you just bubble wrapping the crap out of it and super bagging it and, you know, duct taping it? <laughs> like that's a, it's a long way to go. Actually, I've been uh, lately using Vino Shipper boxes, oh. and I love those. Yeah. Just leave, leave the bubble wrap behind. You know, if I, I, I didn't, but if I were going to do it, I would put it all. I, I sent 12 bottles, so it's literally they're double boxed. If anybody's not aware of, of them, Vino Shipper puts two bottles in this little fold up cardboard thing, and they're, you know, they're all pretty well insulated, top and bottom, side to side. And then you, mm-hmm. you can get six of those in one of their boxes. I've gotten also gotten boxes of two from commercial meteries from, from again, from Moonlight Meadery. I've gotten two bottles and four bottle pack Vino shipper boxes. So if commercial shippers are using them, that's good enough for me, you know? Yeah. Uh, but if, if I guess if I were going to go the extra mile, I would just take that whole 12, 12 bottle Vino shipper case and put that in a bigger box with bubble wrap, I guess. But I, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm pretty confident it's going to get there. I hope it will. Yeah, I just I, I get all paranoid about you know shipping things. I've had I've shipped off. Um, my last time I entered the mead uh, house competition, I I thought I had just done a good job of packing it up, and I guess whoever was ship whoever was moving the box uh, must have dropped it or something because I get a call from Ryan. He's going, hey, uh, yeah, this this is not not alive. So sorry. So uh, ever since then, I've had this little paranoia and I make sure and, you know, super, super wrap things. Um, I did have a Beano shipper failure, but I think it was my fault. Um, those boxes have, uh, the way they're made, there's, there's one side where there's like a little window for mm-hmm. the bottles. And I'm pretty sure I put packed two of those boxes window to window. Mm. And so I'm pretty sure that's why one of the bottles busted. Yeah. But, uh, I will still, I will still line the box, the shipping box with a plastic bag just for that reason. Yeah. yeah. That it's, um, that's so cool though. I, I haven't, I haven't heard of many people shipping overseas, especially I, I can't imagine expense wise. It's, it's cheap, but also it, it can be kind of sketchy. You know, you're going a long way. Uh, again, I, I, I probably wouldn't have done it, but for, uh, Kevin Meinsma in my club, uh, I think Nathan Stegman also sent some over there. Um, not sure if any of the other guys are sending them, but Kevin led the way and he said, there's this Polish shipping company 
you, you ship it to UPS and they forward it to this Polish shipping company, which is in New Jersey. And then they take it over from there. And the whole thing was like 80 bucks for 12 bottles. Wow. Not bad. That's pretty good. <laughs> Holy cow. It's, it's, that's a little expensive compared to what you might pay for a stateside competition, but not that much more. Yeah. I was going to say I've spent, you know, just on small boxes that you have 20 bucks, 25 bucks on, you know, one or two bottles. So right. it can be, it can be pricey, you know, whichever yeah. right you're going, man. Well, that's impressive. Uh, were any of them Polish meats? <laughs> I have to ask. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very, there was, there's a very, I shouldn't say anything because mm. there probably will be some of our Polish meat friends yeah. listening to this will, podcast, but, uh, but you're good. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the Polish meat is the big thing, but you know, though they make things other than Polish meat. Yeah. I went to Czech, Czech Republic and they make things other than Pilsner. So, mm -hmm. you know, Polish meat, I'm sure will be a big part of the competition, but, I don't think any of I, I didn't send any. I don't think any of my friends sent Polish meats. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's fun. So I have a, just a few more questions, and then I and I'll let you go. I know we've got you might have some things to do this evening. I would love to know about drink more mead. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, always. What um, do you have a specific like yeast strain that you're going to most of the time now, or are you playing around with a bunch of them? Yeah, you know, I'm very boring that way. I use 71B almost exclusively. It's not bad, though. Sometimes like D47, but usually 71B. I've made a few um, collab projects with um, uh, Kevin Meinsma and Pat. Oh, geez, Pat's going to kill me because I'm spacing on his last name. But we've made a, uh, several collab projects together, and, and uh, Kevin is the scientist, and he comes up with the recipes, and we just follow them. So, yeah. you know, he, he's – we use whatever yeast he recommends and, and uh, they've been fun. They've been, they've really turned out good. Most recently we just made a port style mead, which was, uh, we started out with 15, it was a 30 gallon batch, 15 gallons of black currant mead. Each of us contributed five gallons at 18% went into a rum barrel. Wow. And it was aged for nine months in a rum barrel. And then uh, we each, each of us made, another five gallons of a different mead. And then we got together with all of Kevin's um, mad scientist stuff and figured out what would be the perfect blend of all those things. And then uh, they were all 18% meads too. And uh, then we uh, accentuated it with a brandy to top it all off. So it's, uh, it's pretty nice by the fire on a cold winter wow. night. Yeah, that's good. That sounds wonderful. Uh, I'd love that. Uh, you know, it's so co cold outside. Something like that seems just like a nice warming thing. It is. Uh, that is for sure something you would want to, you know, set your friend down and say, no, I'm going to serve you this. And it's going to be a snit. It's going to be because a bottle of that and you're out for the night. And yeah. it's sneaky yeah. as hell, too. It does not taste boozy at all. Yeah. I, man, I can only imagine. I would love to spend some time um, – oaking in barrels i'm currently a little uh you know not able to do much with space i have lots of space here more than lots of people but um not enough to fit a barrel necessarily and so it'd be fun to to experiment one day into that realm yeah talk a friend into it yeah Make i can host the barrel uh, so one of my good friends is uh is doing the most he's in one of the other youtubers and so um i think he was actually at valkyrie's horn you might have you might have seen him but, Two years ago, there hasn't been a live Valkyrie Swarm since the first year. Yeah. So um, the it, he has a big space, but it's one of those situations where I might have to commit to him, like, hey, let's go. Maybe we, like, split time. Like, I'll keep it at my house for a little bit. You keep it at yours. We can, like, see what happens. But that'd be, that'd be a lot. You can say, do. why don't you keep the barrel at your house and we can drink it all at my house? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. So I have one last little – kind of topic and it's it's something different with you being so involved in the bjcp i assume you are you, you said you're mead certified so you are um, you're familiar with this process do you have any recommendations for people who are like myself who are desiring to go through that process is there any tips or tricks that you would give us um the the bjcp website is really pretty rich with content for what you need to pass the test um, 
Varietal honeys, you need to know a lot about varietal honeys and what they contribute. You need to know a lot about um, fruits and what they contribute to a mead. Uh, you need to know a lot about spices. And uh, it, it starts to sound daunting, but it, I, I, would, I would not be afraid to, to jump in there. Uh, you're going to pass a, an online exam uh, they're talking about raising the price of it, but right now you can, I think you can get three attempts at the exam for 20 or $25, something like that. Wow. Just do that. Okay. Just do that. Yeah. And a lot of people just take the first, the, their first try, they just um, do it cold just to see what they're, they're running into. Um, take notes, take notes what the questions are. You'll probably see him again in the second and third attempt also, some of the questions. There's a big pool, so, you know, you're not going to see all the questions. Um, the questions about the BJCP, the answers are known and they're published on the BJC website. So there are, there are those also. You, you should ace those. That shouldn't be a problem. Uh, so once you get – it's just pass-fail. 60% should not be that hard a thing to, to muster. Um, and then after that, the tasting exam. Um, do, do you judge a lot of mead? Oh, I, I, well, I don't, uh, I would not say I've officially judged a lot of meads. I've done one competition. We, we hosted a competition here in Oklahoma city for last year for the first time called mead stampede. So that was my only experience in judging, but I, we do a lot of tasting obviously. And, uh, I, I feel pretty comfortable with that. Yeah. Judge. Yeah. Nothing, nothing will prepare you for the tasting part of the exam though than writing score sheets. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't get to mead competitions, seriously get together with like-minded individuals, maybe make a little mead study group and get together and drink mead, but don't just drink mead, fill out a score sheet on all of them mm -hmm. and, and give, and furthermore do it in the recommended time, which is 12 minutes per score sheet. Okay. In, in, in the meat exam, you're going to have to take, taste six meats in 90 minutes. Mm. And not, nothing will prepare you for that more than writing six score sheets in 90 minutes. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's the part. I mean, I've spent enough time in this, uh, you know, I'm a teacher. And so that my brain has, has just taken and tried to absorb as much information as I can so that I could, of course, regurgitate it out to people. So the written test is... Uh, not as daunting to me. There are some aspects, but it is that, that uh, it's, tasting. It's, it's true, false, multiple choice. It's not even a written test. Yeah. It's online. So uh, that doesn't worry me. It's more the tasting. You know, that's, that is something that it can be a little bit tough. Now, um, the tasting is also pass fail though. It's 60, 60%. Yeah. So, and, and so, and, and, and anybody who has looked at a beer or mead score sheet, um, I've got a um, manual uh, that people, it's, it's available online. The people write to me at alboyce.com, or excuse me, alboyce at comcast.net. I will send you the link to download it. It's called the BJC, or the Dummies Guide to the BJCP. And it's for beer, but it applies mm -hmm. to me too, in terms of how, mm -hmm. how to pass both the judging. That deals with the written exam also. That also has all of the BJCP questions and answers in it. So um, that's, I'll put that tasting, down. That's, oh, sorry. Tasting, tasting is uh, just do a lot of it. Just do a lot of it. Um, uh, here's a tip is each one of the sections on a score sheet have little keywords beneath it, beneath it. Try to write a sentence or two about each one of those keywords. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't forget to mention honey yeah. copiously yeah. because that's what you're dealing with. You know? Yeast, honey, if, if, if it's a fruit or a spice meat, obviously you want to talk about those things too. But um, in beer, I tell people, so if you say malty, that's good. But if you say high malty, that's a little better. Uh -huh. And if you say high pills malty, that's best. So as much robust language, I guess, I hate that word, but as robust descriptions you can give, um, it's going to be better off for you.
Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm going to butcher the, the, what the test is. Can you explain to us what that test looks like, the tasting test? Um, 90 minutes, six needs. Uh, they'll be distributed to you in 15-minute intervals. Um, there's the score sheet is about half the score sheet is lines for you to write in. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other half is a list of troubleshooting um, things you might find wrong with it that you can check off, you know, whether it's acidic, whether it's fusel, things like that. Um, in the mead score sheet, let me see if I get this right because I'm not looking at it right now. In the beer, it's aroma, appearance, flavor, mouth feel, and overall. And you should fill up all those lines. Every line should be actually crammed. Actually, there's points given for if you don't fill, or I should say points taken away if you don't fill up the lines. Um, but if, if you practice writing these score sheets, you're going to have no problem. You're probably going to want to write on the backsides too. But don't because you've only got 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but say something about each one of those keywords in, in those first in, meat with meat, it's aroma, appearance, flavor and mouthfeel are together in mead. Mm -hmm. And then overall, um, try to keep those first three sections on the mead on the mead uh, score sheet as objective, what you're actually sensing. Don't, don't get into, oh, uh, this was really harsh or whatever. Um, get into, you know, what you're actually sensing. Um, even if it's so harsh that all you taste is acid or all you taste is an off flavor, you still got to talk about the honey. You still got to talk about the yeast. If it's only to say, I can't get any yeast aromatics from under this off flavor, mm -hmm. you still have to talk about it. Uh, finally, and overall, uh, there's a little box at the bottom of the score sheet that says, well, I don't remember right now, but it's like, excellent, world class, um, very good, good, fair, problematic. Uh, the very first words that you should put in the overall section should be one of those words, because that's going to, that's, A, that's going to tell them you have talked about how you enjoyed the mead by using one of those words. That's points. You get points for that. And it's the easiest way to do it. Um, it also gives you a range. If you've called it very good, very good is like 30 to 37. So your score then better be 30 to 37 down below. And you get points for that saying, yeah, your, your score given matches what you wrote for how well you enjoyed the mead. Mm -hmm. Then the next tip I can give you after you said that word, then give a positive statement, something positive, no matter how bad it was, there's something good about it. It was very red, you know, something, you know, it was, the redness was superior, you know, <laughs> even it was very wet. I don't know. <laughs> you know, give them a positive thing. Uh, that's points because they're, they're asking, was the, was the judge professional? And that's what professional judges do is give a positive reinforcement right away. And then go in to say uh, what was wrong with it. Uh, look for stylistic problems as well as technical problems and give specific suggestions for how to improve those problems. Um, at the bottom of every score sheet I write, thanks for entering, but mm -hmm. you don't get any points for that. It's just, <laughs> it's just courtesy. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, I, uh, I, I asked this, of course, as self-interest because I'm one day I'm hoping to go through this, through that and do the BJCP meat certification. But also I know that there are a fair amount of people who are watching this now who that might be on their radar. And I, I think that so. is, uh, uh, yeah, I, I hope so too. I hope that we are, I think that is a great way to expand this meat community is have more people who are investing further. And that doesn't mean judging me doesn't mean that you are, you have to actively be at every single judging competition, but it means that you are taking a step forward and saying, I want to do more. I want to make this better. I'll tell you when I, uh, I got involved with the BJCP by accident. Um, I heard that there was this program that taught you how to make better beer. Mm. And that's not really what they do. But after you have a night, after you have a stout night and you've tasted eight stouts, 
you kind of know what to look for in stouts after that. And it's the same thing with mead. If you have mead night and, you know, you, you, you taste eight pie mints all in a row, you go, oh, I see what he did there. And I like that. And I didn't like that. And, but you compare all eight of them and you go like, oh, and you better have a when you compare yeah. all eight of them. But, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it, it will make you, being a judge will make you a better mead maker. Um, not just from taking the class, not just from passing the test, but actually doing the judging. And I would differ with you from, from that standpoint. If you want to become a better mead maker, judge more. Mm -hmm. Taste more mead. Yeah. And what, yeah, a, yeah. what a better way to do it for free than go do it at a contest. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's so, yeah. I, I completely agree. And I think, um, I, I love that I've, that you have so much history with this mead community. And I've, um, I've, kind of wish, you know, it's one of those things where I wish I could go back in time. And whenever I was in Minneapolis for the, for, uh, the R and B that I could have sat down and chatted with you more. Cause you are, man, you're a great dude and you have such a wealth of information. And so I, I sure hope that everybody listening to this has, has gained something. I know I absolutely have. Um, Al, thank you for your time. Thank you for investing last, in this community. Let me in insert one more plug. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Tw tw towards what you just said. If you want to sit down with me or Nathan or Adam or Kevin or Josh Holbrook or Steve Letty, uh, all, all these great mead makers that are in the St. Paul, Minneapolis area, come to Valkyrie's Horn. Mm -hmm. As far as we know right now, it's going to be live. It's going to be September 16th and 17th. Set your calendars. Sweet. Absolutely. I, uh, I wanted to enter this year and then I missed the deadline. I just wasn't thinking. And so I, that's, that's on my bucket list. This 2022 is my year to uh, submit more meads to tournament because cool. into competitions, because I would love to see what, what happens. So well, I look, I look forward to hearing your name uh, shouted out from the winner's stand. Oh, uh, I can only hope so. <laughs> Al, thank you so much for your time. I've appreciated this. I know that everybody listening has um, has had a great time listening to this and I will be putting Valkyrie Horn information below I'll put your email as well so that if people would like to contact you for questions or anything um, you can find all I'll that text stuff you down the, uh, I'll text you that link of the uh, dummies guide where you can That'd find be great. it online that would be perfect that would be perfect so thank you for your time Al I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday night and it sounds like you got some more mead to drink Lots. I got a basement full. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, thank you for your time. We'll, we'll talk to you later. Hey, Garrett.